which we explore the nature of randomness to get to grasp with statistics. In the first four lectures, we covered the fundamentals of handling data with R. And now we will shift our focus back from the how and towards the why of data analysis and statistics. We will talk about different statistical tests, common mistakes, and how to avoid them, but also how to spot them in other research works. Uh, but of course, we will do so using R. So you will learn one or the other useful function or technique along the way. In most instances, it should be clear when I'm using R solely to demonstrate an idea from statistics, or whether the code is something you will likely use for your own analysis. I am open for questions if things are unclear in any of the two cases. And for a purely aesthetic code, I might also just speed the typing up in the edit, but you can also always look it up in the script. So to understand statistics means reasoning about randomness, understanding randomness first. There's one phrase which um, pops up quite a lot in academic literature. And this phrase is statistically significant. And sometimes even very significant. While they often use carelessly, they have a clearly defined meaning. A meaning we will uncover today. This meaning is related to the concept of p-values, uh, which have an equally bad rep reputation for being frequently misused. The p in p-value stands for probability. So in order to understand p-values, we need to understand probability and learn to deal with the randomness, chance or luck you will. Let's look at one example. Say you and a friend are playing a game of chess. When your friend proudly proclaims, I am definitely the better player. Prove it, you reply. That's easy, she says. I won seven out of the eight rounds we played today. Ah, that's just luck. Your less witty and slightly stubborn response. Now, as expected, we shall be using R to resolve this vital conflict. First, we need some definitions. Those of you involuntarily uttered an hypothesis, a testable assumption. And we want to test these hypotheses using statistics. The first hypothesis, I am the better player, is what we call the alternative hypothesis. The name can be a bit confusing because most often this is your actual scientific hypothesis, the thing you are interested in. So, Alternative to what, you might ask? It is alternative to the so-called null hypothesis, which is our second statement. This is just luck. The null hypothesis provides a sort of baseline for all our findings. It usually goes along the lines of what if our observations are just based on chance alone, where chance can be any source of random variation in our system. The tricky part is that there's no way to directly test the alternative hypothesis. All we can test is the null hypothesis. Because for any null hypothesis we discard, there are always multiple alternative hypotheses that could explain our data. In our example, even if we end up discarding the idea of our friend's best success being only down to luck, this does not prove our alternative hypothesis that she is the better player. She could still be cheating, for example. Do keep this in mind when we transfer this to a more scientific setting. Just because we show something is unlikely to have arisen by chance does not mean that your favorite alternative hypothesis is automatically true. So, after these words of warning, let's test some null hypotheses. As always, I am in our studio in a fresh Markdown document, and what I will do is load the tidy words first. So if you are following along, don't forget this part. And now what I want to do is test our, our hypothesis with a little simulation. And before testing any hypothesis, it is important to have defined H0 and H1 properly which is what we did in the previous section, but we need a little more, little, but we need to be a little bit more specific. So, winning by chance would entail a completely random process. 
which we can model by a coin flip. R has the lovely function sample, where we can take any number of things from a vector with or without replacement. So, oh, first we need a vector to sample from, and let's create a coin. Well, a coin is a vector that contains heads and tails. And now we can sample from the coin. If we call it without any other arguments, it will just sample both things. So it will randomly produce a different order. We can also tell it how much we want to sample. Let's say we want uh, to get 10 things from this. This will not work because, well, if we take heads from, from our vector and then we take tails and then there's nothing left to take. So what we need to do is say replace equals true. And now we're putting the thing back after we sampled it. So let's make this a little bit more specific to the question we previously had. For a game of chess, there can be, um, let's leave out draws. Let's assume one of us will win. There can be two winners. Either it's you or your friend. And now we can get some random winners. a bunch of games by sampling from the winner bucket sort of let's get eight games because this is what we had in our debate he said i won seven out of eight games that's pretty good so. and let's not make a typo here for the winners the winners and now we have a bunch of random winners, and if we run this a bunch of times, we get different results every time. What we also can do is check whether, for example, the winner is um, your friend. And this gives us a logical vector. R has a bit nice property that when you Try to calculate with a logical vector, it automatically converts true to one and zero and false to zero. So if I take, for example, the sum of this, it tells me how many rounds your friend won, which was four surprisingly often. Now it's five, a bunch of times four, seven. So random. If I, were to, if I were to run this script a million times, the resulting proportion of random wins for both of you would of course be very close to 50-50, because we used a fair coin. However, we don't have the time, the time to play this much chess, and we sure don't have the money to run a million replicates for each experiment in the lab, for example. Uh, but here, in our little simulated world, we have near infinite resources, because our uh, because our inform our simulation is not computationally costly. Now let's do the following. I will tag this into a function, and I will also make this a function of this size, the number of games played, and call it n. So the functions will be called get n wins, and the function of n. And what it will do is, well, in there we define this winner vector, and then we get some random winners with size n, and then we report how many wins our friend got, and return this implicitly from the file. Uh, let's test this. For example, with 10 games, and our friend won 5, which is actually what we expect with a fair coin.
let's see what kind of distribution we get from this if we run this a bunch of times. So number of wins will be the result of running this function a bunch of times. So to run this a bunch, bunch of times, I will use map double. So what map double does is it takes a vector and passes it passes each element individually to this function. And for this example, I will use the same n every time. So I just repeat rep. I just repeat um, eight one thousand times. Let me show you what this does. Just one thousand times number eight. So one thousand times we will do these eight games. And for this we use this function. And map double is one of the variants of map which always returns numbers. So just map returns a list, map double returns numbers. If I look at this, um, let's actually only look at the first couple of win uh, of number of wins, because it's gonna be 1000. <laughs> okay. And I think the best way to explore this is using the histogram. So what I will do is I will package this up in the table, which gives me this table. And now our tables are nicer to work with the ggplot. So I can pass this to ggplot. I want the number of wins on the x-axis and the y-axis will actually be computed by ggplot and specifically will be comp computed by geombar. Let's also make sure the x-axis is scaled uh, correctly. From zero, you can get zero wins or a maximum of eight. And this is what we get. Now you could call this a bar plot. Another name for this is a histogram. A histogram is a type of plot that shows how often each value occurs in a vector. And usually with a normal histogram, the values are put into bins first. So we are grouping close values together for continuous values. But in this case, because we have just discrete values, there's no um, half wins in this case, um, a bar plot does not do any binning. Right, the histogram would. So for the histogram, continuous data where we do need, to, need to do some binning to get, to get bars we would use Geom histogram. As expected, the most common number of wins out of eight, if the wins are just random coin tosses, is four. And let's see how this distribution changes if we change n. So for this, I will run a slightly bigger simulation. I will call it simulation. And I will start by, oh, let's actually comment this out so I can show you step by step what I'm doing. I'm using this function crossing from tidyr. And crossing allows us to get all combinations of elements from two or, two or more vectors. So for example, let's say n can be from one to 15. And then we need some replicates. So replicate one to uh, replicate. Let's go for 1000. And this creates all combinations of n and rep, which is 15,000 rows. Now afterwards, I will use mutate, get a random number of wins for each replicate. So I will use map double. And I will pass n to it to the function get n wins. So the difference here is now we are passing a different n, the so n's from 1 to 15, as opposed to up here, where I just tried out uh, the same n equals 8 a bunch of times. And this will give me a number of wins for each of the replicates on each n. 
Let's save this in this variable. And also print it down here so we can see. And now what I like to do is use ggplot to visualize this. We will use another, we will make another bar block, but we will make one with a twist. Winds on the x axis. Then we need a bar plot. But we will facet wrap this by n. All right, look at that. With the fair coin, the most common number of wins should be half the number of the coin flips. Note, however, that it is still possible to flip a coin 15 times and not win a single time. It is just very, very unlikely, and so the bars are very, very small, and we can't even see them in here. It is also entirely possible to win 15 out of 15 games by luck. Just very unlikely. Uh, let's go back to the original debate. The first statement, I am better, is something that can never be definitively proven. Because there's always the possibility, now, no matter how small, that the same result could have arisen by pure chance alone. Even if she wins 100 times and we don't take a single game from her. This sort of outcome is still not impossible to appear just by flipping a coin. But what we can do is calculate how likely a certain event is under the assumption of the null hypothesis, so chance alone. And we can also decide on some threshold alpha at which we reject the null hypothesis. This is called the significance threshold. When we make an observation and then calculate that probability for an observation, like this or more extreme, smaller than the threshold, then we deem the result statistically significant. And the probability thus created is called the p-value. Let's go back to our simulation. For our simulation, we can get the mean of the number of wins. The mean of the number of wins greater or equal seven. And in my example, this is 3.7%. This is smaller than the commonly used significance threshold of alpha equal to 5%. So, with 7 out of 8 wins, we would reject the null hypothesis and for this true finding. Do note that this threshold, alpha equals 0 0.005, p-value threshold, it is completely arbitrary. So, no matter how commonly and thoughtlessly it is used, um, remember this. Now, this was just from a simulation with the 1000 trials, so we can't be arbitrarily precise. But in this case, there is a mathematical formula for this probability. What we created by counting the number of successes in a series of yes or no trials, called a binomial distribution. For the most common distributions, R provides a set of functions. There's always a function starting with a D for density. And this gives us the probability density function. In the case of discrete values, this is an actual probability. But if we have continuous values, we will always have to get take an integral first to get an actual probability. And there's also the functions starting with p for probability, which are these integrals. So for binomial distributions, we have a d binom which is the probability density for the binomial distribution. Basically, this up here, this shape. So let's calculate the binomial probability for getting exactly 7 wins out of 8. So the vector of quantiles, we want the 7. Then we want the size, the number of games to be 8. And the probability of winning each trial. Let's assume it is random because this is our null hypothesis, and oh, this is really, really close to what we calculated with our simulation. But actually, to get the proper p-value, 
we wanted the number of winds to be greater or equal to 7, not exactly the density at 7. So let's look at this integral, p binom. I have the help page up here. So we want, uh, let's say, 7. And the size is going to be 8 again, probability again, 0 0.5. Now this part throws a lot of people off because by default, by the default we have lower dot tail equals true, which means the probabilities are given as the probability for x being less than or equal to x. Otherwise, it returns the probability for x being larger than some x, which is exactly not what we want. What we wanted is the probability to be seven or more. So now if I, so this is the inverse of what we want. If I set lower dot tail to false, I get the upper tail, but I do not get the seven because the upper tail will be greater, not greater equal. So we need to change this seven to a six. Maybe it's more helpful to write seven minus six in here, uh, minus one. Seven minus one. And now this is the actual p-value, and this is um, even closer to what we have up here. So what we do is we reject the null hypothesis of the number of wins being solely down to chance. One little side note: for some visualizations of functions, I sometimes like to use the function from base r, not the full-blown ggplot because they can be quite good at their own small task, even though they are not as versatile and powerful as ggplot. So for example, let's visualize the binomial distribution, the density function, using the curve function. The curve produces a plot from an expression, so we can provide an expression of x. So sort of like a f we can provide a function in here, basically. So function of x. So x can be this x, which will be varied for the function, and then we want size being 8 and probability 0, 0 0.5. As a type of the plot, I want stairs, s means stairs in this plotting function, because we have discrete probabilities, we can't just connect all the points straight lines. So we want to go from 0 to 8. This is the maximum number of wins you can get. So the total number of points we will draw is going to be 9. And this is the density function for the binomial distribution. Now let's do the same for the integral. By just copying this, replacing the p with uh, the d with the p for our probability, and this does not work because in p binom it is actually q for quantile and not the rest stays stay the same. There are two more functions I want to showcase from this family. The third is the so-called quantile functions. Quantiles divide a probability distribution into pieces of equal probability. One example for such a quantile is the 50th percentile, also known as the median, which divides the values such that half of the values are above and half are below. We can keep dividing the two halves as well, so that we end up with more quantiles and eventually we arrive at these quantile functions. It is the inverse of the probability function, so we obtain it by swapping the axis. So let's replace the q, uh, the p with the q, and now in here it's actually p for probability, and we are going from zero to 
1, because probabilities are always between 0 and 1. But again, we are going in 9 steps. And now we get the inverse of the probability function. Uh, quantile functions are also useful for deciding if a random sample that you got follows a certain distribution, where you can make quantile quantile plots, which we will not do today. Uh, lastly, there's always an R variant of the, these, these functions. So, for example, R binome, which gives us a random sample following this distribution. Say we want to run 10 experiments, 8 games each, and a probability of 0.5 for success. And now we get a number of random, random number of successes following the binomial distribution. So previously, we had decided to abandon the null hypothesis that both players are equally good which equates to a 50% win chance for each player. Um, but we had, have not determined how much better she is and how much better does she need to be for us to reliably discard the null hypothesis after just eight games. The generalization of this idea of how much better, so the true difference, is called the effect size. Our ability to decide that something is statistically significant when there is in fact a true difference, is called the statistical power. It depends on the effect size, our significance threshold alpha, and the sample size n, so the number of games. We can explore the concept with another simulation. So this time, I'm storing the number of trials I want to do in a variable. And let's go for... 10,000. And we'll create another variable and I call it simulation again. We don't need the old one. And to show you the process, I'll leave this commented out. Again, we find our parameter space using the crossing function. So we want n to be, let's say, uh, let's test the number of values, um, 8, so up to 100 games, 1000 games, and 10,000 games. And the true probability winning, which is the true difference in skills, sort of, between the two of us, Let's go for one example where both players are equally good with a 50% chance for each win. Now I realize chess is not the best example because there can be draws, but let's ignore draws for now. And then let's take one where she's so much better that she will win in 80% of cases and we will win in 20%. And then let's uh, use one where it's 90, 9%. This is what it looks like. And now I will use another trick from dplyr. Rowwise is similar to group by and essentially puts each row into its own group. This can be useful when working with list columns or things that create list columns or for running a function with the varying, arg varying arguments. And it allows, allows us to treat the inside of mutate a bit like as if we were using one of those map functions like I did above. For more information, there's a link in the script. So what I want to do is calculate the number of wins. And I need to package this in the list column because there will be a number of wins for each row, so we can't so we need to package it, package it in a list. And I want random numbers that are binomially distributed, so our binome, where the size is equal to n, the probability is equal to the true probability in this uh, table, and the number of 
and the number of observations we want to make is the number of trials. Now, if I run this, you see there's this list column which has 10,000 different numbers for the number of wins that happened in this example. And now I can also create, calculate a p-value from this number of wins. So the probability to get the number of wins for, so for each win here, for each win in here, we get a p-value. We need to package this in list as well because it will give us one p-value for each element of the, this vector and for each element of the list. So I use p-binom where the quantiles are the wins minus one. The size is equal to n. The probability we are testing against our null hypothesis is it's just chance, so 0 0.05. And we are setting lower the tail to false. Now I have a bunch of p-values. And because I did this row-wise thing, what I also want to do now is ungroup to get rid of these row-wise groups. And now I store this in my simulation variable. This leaves us with 10,000 simulated numbers of wins at n games for different true probabilities of her winning. So how much better our friend is. We then calculate the probability to have this or a greater number of wins under the null hypothesis that there's equal probabilities. In other words, the p-values. Let's use ggplot again to visualize this. First, we unnext the wins and p-values. Now we get this really long format. And then we can use ggplot in here. I want the distribution of p-values, actually. Not the number of wins, but the distribution of p-values in this example. And then I use geom histogram and facet by the true probability that we used. And also by n. I want to make sure that we label this properly. I want to label both. And I will set the y-axis to be free. And I want four columns. I will also add a vertical line, so the V line at the x-intercept of where the typical significant significance cutoff is, so 0 0.005. And let's make this red. We notice a couple of things in this plot. As the number of games approaches very high numbers, the p-values for the cases where the null hypothesis is actually true so both players have the same chance of winning, start following a uniform distribution. So for a true null hypothesis, all p-values are equally likely. This seems counterintuitive at first, but it is a direct consequence of the definition of the p-value. And the consequence of this is that if we apply our regular significance threshold of 5%, by definition, we will say that there is a true difference, even though there is none. So we will reject a true null hypothesis. This is called a false positive. So by definition, we will get at least alpha false positives in our experiments. Later, we will learn why the real number of false positives is even higher. Another name for false positives is type 1 errors. On the other side of the coin, there are also cases where there is a true difference, so these ones. 
not here. But we reject the null hypothesis because we get a p-value larger than alpha. So these are all false negatives. And their rate is sometimes referred to as beta. Another name for false negatives is type 2 errors. People don't particularly like talking about negative things or errors, so instead you will often see the inverse 1 minus beta, which is the statistical power. So the proportion of correctly identified positives of the actual positives is something we can show in another plot. Let's take our simulation. Again, we are nest. Now we group by the true probability and n, and we summarize. How many significant results did we get? Now let's take the mean, so what percentage significant results did we get? So this is the number of smaller or equal 0, 0, 0,5. So this gives us the percentage of significant results for each true probability and each n. And now we use ggplot. So what we see here in this example, in the cases where the null hypothesis was actually true, so both players are equally likely to win, we still get 5% positives, so those will all be false positives. And in the cases where there was a difference, so the true probability was 0.8, for example, or 0.9, in the first case, if we just run eight games, and the probability of winning is 80%. We only detect a um, statistically significant difference in 50% of cases. So you better hope you're in the parallel universe where you detect your difference. Now we just ran simulations here. There are packages out there which have a function called to compute the power for a binomial test. But I think the simulation is way more approachable. And the cool thing about simulations is that they work even when there is no analytical solution. So you can use them to play around when you're planning an experiment. Let's look into some of the pitfalls of p-values. Remember that from the definition of p-values, we get a significant result even if there is no true difference in 5% of cases, assuming we use this as our alpha value. Well, what if we test a bunch of things? This is called multiple testing, and there is a problem associated with it. For example, if you test 20 different things, and your statistical tests will produce a significant result just by chance in 5% of cases, the expected number of significant results is 1. So we are not very surprised to get 1. Uh, speaking of surprised, in his book, which is available online for free, which is called Statistics Done Wrong, there's a really good quote by Alex Reinhardt, where he describes p-values. A p-value is not a measure of how right you are, or how significant the difference is. It is a measure of how surprised you should be if there is no actual difference between the groups, but you got data suggesting there is. A bigger difference, or one backed up by more data, suggests more surprise and a smaller p-value. So in the above example, where you test 20 different things, we are not very surprised. But if you focus too hard on the one significant result, trouble ensues. In a publish or perish mentality, this can easily happen. And negative findings are not published nearly enough. 
though most published findings are likely exaggerated, just by US statistics. Uh, John Bohannon showcased this beautifully by running a chocolate consumption study and getting it published. And he wrote this blog post about it called I Fooled Millions Into Thinking Chocolate Helps Weight Loss, Here's How, which I really recommend. So how can we go about this? Let's talk about multiple testing correction. The simplest approach is to take all the p-values that you have. Um, let's just make some up. Don't make up p-values when you're doing research. For example, please. So I'm just making some up. And now we can use the function p dot dust. And we give it the p values. And it returns adjusted p values. We need to give it a method. The simplest method to explain is the von Ferroni correction. Let's see if I spelled this correctly. By opening up the help page and running this. No, I did not run this correctly. Let's use the old trick of copy and pasting from the help page. Now we corrected our p-value, p-values. What the Bonferroni correction does is just takes all our p-values and de multiplies it by the number of comparisons we ran, but it kept it at one. You can't have a probability of higher, higher than one. Of course, this loses some statistical power. Remember, there is no free lunch in statistics. A slightly more sophisticated method of controlling the false discovery rate is the benjamini hochberg procedure, and it retains a bit more power. So instead, Bonferroni, we write B H. And here's what happens behind the scenes. Uh, first, you sort all p values in ascending order. So we here and then this one and then this one, so forth. And then you choose an FDR, let's call it Q, you are willing to accept and call the number of tests that were done M. Yeah. And you find the largest p value for which this p value is smaller or equal than the index times this Q times. Uh, divided by m. And then you use this for your new significance threshold and scale the p-values accordingly. You can look at these steps up again in the script. Now this sort of multiple testing is fairly obvious. You notice it when you end up with a large number of p-values, for example when you're doing a genetic screening and testing thousands of genes. Other related problems are harder to spot. For a single research question, there are often different statistical tests that you could run. Likewise, likewise, simply looking at your data is a form of comparison, if it influences your choice of statistical test. So ideally, you first run some exploratory experiments that are not meant to test your hypothesis. And then you decide on the tests you need, the sample size you want for a particular power, then you run the actual experiments, designed to test your hypothesis. Um, at this point, I want to give another shout out to Alex Reinhardt's book, Statistics Done Wrong, which is a very pleasant read, and it also shines some, some more light on the other forms of the hacking. You can read it in a couple of afternoons. There is another um, more subtle problem called the base rate fallacy. As an example, we assume a medical test testing for a certain condition. In medical testing, different words are used for the same concepts we defined above. So here we have sensitivity, which is the same as power, which is the same as the true positive rate, one minus beta. And we have specificity, which is the true negative rate, one minus alpha. Let's assume a test with a sensitivity of 90%, and a specificity of 92%. When we visit a doctor to get a test and we get a positive test result, so what is the probability that we are in fact positive? 
a true positive. While the test has a specificity of 92%, so if we were negative, we would have detected that in 92% of cases. Does this mean we can be 90% certain that we are actually positive? Well, no. What we are ignoring here is the base rate, which is which for diseases is called the prevalence, the pr proportion at which a disease exists in the general population. So let's say we are picking 1,000 people at random, and in these we have 10 positives. So we have prevalence of 10%. Of those 10 people, 9 will be tested through positives, and 1 will not be tested positive. The test will say it's negative, so it's false negative. Of the remaining people that are not positive, 97 will be tested as false positive because there are so many negatives in our sample. Even though we have a relatively high specificity, it will produce a lot of false positives simply because we are testing a lot of negative people. So if we visualize this, these are all the true negatives. There's one. Um, test which will be negative, even though it should have been positive. And then there's a bunch of false positive tests and the true positive tests. So the probability that with the true positive tests, out of all the positives, we are actually positive, um, it's just 10%. Formally, this is described by Bayes' formula. And you can read this as the probability of A given B is the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. These ones here, the prevalence, are called priors in Bayesian statistics. So after today, you should be familiar with the following concepts, null and alternative hypothesis, p-values and statistical significance, the binomial distribution, the concepts of probability density, probability and quantile function, effect size and statistical power, false positives and false negatives, as well as multiple testing, p-hacking and bias theorem. So just by itself, this is quite a bit of material to take in, so I try to limit the exercises for today leave you some time to digest all this. So um, have fun with the exercises and I will see you on Friday.